Well, good evening. Uh, happy Easter. It's great to all be together uh, to worship. Now, a lot of you have, uh, a lot of you have asked me. A lot of you have been a- anticipating, and so by popular demand, I brought the seersucker back, <laughs> resurrected it, if you will. So you're welcome. You're welcome, church. So we are glad you're here. I know a lot of you came here tonight and you're anticipating to uh, hear Pastor Darren and uh, you rolled up and, uh, on my mug. And so uh, hopefully you're only slightly disappointed by that. But the truth is uh, Darren had every intention to be here and preach tonight. But uh, his father has been in declining health and it's getting worse. Uh, his dad actually uh, had a heart attack this week. And so Darren asked me if I would preach tonight uh, so that he could go down to Marion and be with his family. So please keep uh, Darren uh, his dad, his family, in your prayers as they kind of walk through this time. Uh, you know, in times like that, times like sickness and uh, fear and struggle and uncertainty where the truth and the power of the resurrection uh, comes home, where it becomes beautiful, where it really resonates. Like what Paul tells in this, like the greatest chapter in resurrection, chapter 15 here, what he says is the resurrection is like the culmination, the climax of the gospel. Look at, look at verse 1. In verse 1 he says... I would remind you of the gospel. Like, why does he need to remind them of the gospel? Why does he need to remind us of the gospel? Because we forget the gospel. Because we misunderstand, we misconstrue, we lose sight of the gospel. So usually when I'll ask people like, hey, what do you think the Christian gospel is? Like, what is the core message of Christianity? And usually people say something like, oh, the core message of Christianity is like, follow the commandments of God, uh, be a good person, uh, imitate Christ, get your life straight, give your life to God, get, 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 your, get your mess kind of cleaned up. And that might be good advice, it might be good instruction, it might be good morals, it might be good wisdom, but look, you could get good advice from, from anybody. Well, actually, not anybody, but you could get good advice, you get good advice from a lot of people. The word gospel doesn't mean good advice, it means good news. It is an announcement that God has done something. It's an announcement that, that, that something world-shattering, world-changing has actually happened. And so if anyone has ever shared with you the Christian gospel, preached to you the Christian message, and it didn't sound like hope, joy, freedom, good news to you, then either you misheard them or they misspoke. One of the two. So Paul comes here and says the resurrection is the good news that God has intervened in the world. He's intervened in history. He's intervened in our life. And he wins because he's been raised from the dead. He has won. So what does that really mean? What does the resurrection really mean for us? Well, let me, I'm, I'm just going to give you three brief points from this, from this passage. I'll just tell them to you right now up front. Here's what he says. Look, the resurrection disarms our doubts. Jesus in his resurrection conquers our sins. And Jesus in the resurrection revives our hopes. Now you're going, some of you, if you're thinking right now, you're going, how does the resurrection disarm doubt? Like, I think the resurrection probably creates doubt, right? So like all of us, can, you, you might say, look, I can buy into the fact that, that Jesus was a good person and a good teacher and a, and a moral teacher. and People looked at him and followed him. But you're trying to tell me on Easter that he was crucified, dead, buried, three days in a tomb, and then God brought him back to life? That he was actually raised from the dead? That's what Paul's going to argue for here. And what Paul's going to say is actually the resurrection is as historically verifiable a fact as George Washington crossed the Delaware River or whatever other kind of fact you want to throw in there. But that messes with our definition of faith. It's not typically how we think. We kind of think of faith as like, oh, this blind leap into the dark, right? We kind of think about it like the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. I kind of looked it up. Here's what, it, here's what the dictionary says, definition of faith. Faith is the firm belief for something in which there's no proof. In which there's no proof. That's not the kind of faith in resurrection Paul's talking about here. See, Paul is, is reasoning. Paul, Paul's a doubter. He's a skeptic. He's a cynic. And so he's actually going to give voice to those things. He, he uses this little word, if. Eight different times he uses it, right? Let me just give you a quick, quick sampling. So if, when he says if, he's saying if it didn't happen. Let's entertain the other side. Maybe it didn't happen. Let's, let's find out. Verse 13 if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not, Christ has not been raised. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. See, Paul says if. He's starting to entertain our doubt. Listen, this is, this is really great grace from the Bible. Because let's be honest, like every one of us, myself included, we struggle with doubt. 
Every one of us have doubts about things, right? And here's Paul like, all right, let's entertain that. Let's, re, let's, let's examine the evidence, and then he's going to produce the proof. And what he's going to say is, listen, the resurrection is not just some metaphorical symbol of hope. It is a literal fact of history. And we know that for several reasons. And uh, one of the first ones is like, hey, Jesus called it. Like, if you read the Gospels, he said at least three times, probably more, I'm going to die, but then I'll rise again. He called it. Like, it's awesome to call your shot in pool and, like, call your shot in basketball, like, bank shot, sweet. But Jesus called resurrection from the dead. Like, he called that he would die and be raised again. You do that, you call resurrection, like, drop the mic, or out. Like, <laughs> you're the Lord. I mean, like, I, we follow you. Like, that's the deal. So Paul says, all right, let me give you just three more just quick reasons why the resurrection is, is, is true, is real, really happened. Uh, and they're, I think you can remember because they're numbers. There's the 12, the 500, and the 1. So let's look at the 12, verse 5. In verse 5, Paul says, Jesus appeared, resurrected Jesus, appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and to the 12. Who are the 12? 12 disciples, right? He appeared, resurrected to the 12. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, a lot of people you know, later on said, well, maybe... Jesus wasn't really resurrected. Maybe he died and the disciples got together and said, hey, let's make this up. Let's, let's, if we make up, we pretend Jesus rose from the dead, we make it up and then we can start our own religion. We'd be in control of everything, right? Now listen, imagine how a conversation like that would have gone. Like Apostle John comes to, you know, Peter and he's like, hey, Peter, I know Jesus is dead, but let's really, let's, let's make it up and say that he's alive. And Peter's like, listen, nobody's going to buy that. Like nobody has even a category for resurrection in that period of time. Like nobody's going to buy it. Like, hey, we can convince them. We can do it. So Peter says, okay, if, let's, let's pretend that Jesus is risen from the dead. And then if we create our own religion, what do we get? Like, what are we going to get from it, right? If we tell this lie. And, and the answer is, okay, if we create our own religion, we can start this movement of Christianity. Then we get shunned from society. We'll get impoverished. We'll get persecuted, chased, stoned, beheaded, imprisoned, exiled, shunned and ostracized from other people. Like, Okay, yeah, let's do that. Like, that make, it doesn't make any sense, right? Like, the only reason, why do you make up stuff? Why do you lie? The only reason you lie is to give yourself some kind of advantage, right? To, get, to, to help yourself out. You're not going to tell a lie that disadvantages you, which is what they were at, all Christians, at an early point in the Christian movement. And here's the deal. See, all 12 of these guys, almost all 12 of them gave their lives for the specific truth of the resurrection. Now, there have been people that have been duped by other people's lies in, into dying for that lie, right? But no one dies for a lie they created and they already know to be false. It doesn't happen. So there's the 12, but there was more than the 12. Paul says there's the 500. Look, look down at verse 6. Verse 6 says, Then Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Why does that matter? Five, five, he said there's 500 witnesses. And listen, Corinthians was written 15, 20 years from Jesus' death. So this is not like 100 years later you can't check with anybody. The only way Paul could have gotten away with writing this is if the witnesses were still there and you could actually check with them. So he says, you want to do some investigative journalism? There's 500 people uh, that you can go check with who saw him alive. So there's the 12, the 500, and then there's uh, my favorite, the 1 in verse 7. In verse 7 it says, then Jesus appeared to James. Who's, who's James? That's not the disciple James. This is James, Jesus' little brother. Like Mary and Joseph had other kids after Jesus was born. And John 7 tells us that those brothers did not believe in Jesus. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. They didn't believe that he was the Lord before his death. But then he appeared to James, his little brother. You know, James became a leader in the early church. James wrote the book of James, creatively named. James spread the gospel all over. And you say, well, what does that matter? Here's why it matters. I have a little brother. Probably most of you in this room have a brother or a sister. What would have to happen before you would bow down and worship and pray to your brother or sister? Hey, Jesus, 500 people saw you resurrected. That's impressive. But you got your brother to worship you? Done. You're the Lord. I, no more arguments. It had to happen, right? And see what Paul's saying is, listen, if the resurrection, if the resurrection didn't happen, then you don't, you don't need to worry about Jesus. You don't need to listen to Jesus about what he says about anything else, morality, truth, justice, poverty, racism, money, sexuality. 
But if the resurrection did happen, if it was real, then he's the Lord, he's the Messiah, he's the King, and we give all of our lives, all of ourselves to him. Paul says it did happen. So what? So what does that mean for our lives? It disarms our doubts, and the resurrection means it conquers our sins. Look at verse 3 and 4. Paul mentions death and resurrection together. Verse 3, he says, Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and then he was raised on the third day. See, he says, death and resurrection go together. It's the payment and the proof. His death was the payment. His life and resurrection were the proof that payment had been made. The resurrection is like a receipt. It is like the cosmic receipt that our sin has been conquered, that all has been paid. Look, look, look there in verse 17. In verse 17, he says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. If he hasn't been raised, you're still in your sins. The flip side of that is if he has been raised, then we're no longer in our sins. What he's saying is that, listen, when Jesus was raised from the dead, all sin, all brokenness, all pain, all sadnesses, all struggle, and even death itself was conquered by the reigning Messiah, Jesus. The resurrection is the proof that our sins have been conquered. It's, 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 it's the proof that, God, that his sacrifice was accepted. It's the receipt. Like you and I know how receipts are, right? We know how they work. Like it's a time when you needed to keep a receipt and you didn't have one and you couldn't prove that you paid for something. Uh, so I needed my receipts uh, recently. I got a letter uh, and it was an ominous package. It was a very thick envelope and I looked at the return address and it said, Internal Revenue Service. I thought, oh man, what is this? And so like, I like, ripped into this thing, opened it up, and it said, Dear Mr. Beatenball, we reviewed your 2012 taxes. First of all, you're a little behind the eight ball IRS. It's 2015, in case you haven't noticed. But 2012 taxes, and it says, we've determined you owe us an additional $2,863. I'm like, what in the world? Like, no, no, there's no way. Like, I paid my taxes that year. I mean, well, I pay my taxes every year, actually. <laughs> But I definitely paid him that year. And, uh, and so I was like, oh, I got to have the receipt. I got to have the documentation. So like I ran down, like, listen, I'm disorganized by a lot of things, but I do my own tax every year. One thing I'm organized on, I keep my receipts. I keep my documentation. I pull out 2012 folder. I start pulling receipts and documentation. And I start trading letters to the IRS because, you know, they don't have to provide any documentation that I owe them $2,800. But I got to provide all the proof and receipts that I don't owe them $2,800. So we start going back and forth, right, on this. And, and, and then I send them all the final documentation receipts. And then I got this little letter here. I brought it for your amusement. <laughs> Dear Mr. Biedenball, your 2012 inquiry is closed. Amount due, zero. <laughs> Take that, IRS. It's not every day you get to deliver a beat down to the IRS, but... If you have the proof, if you have the receipts, they got to let you go free. The resurrection of Jesus is the receipt that all debts, for those who believe in Christ, all debts have been paid. The resurrection is the proof that says your inquiry before the bar of God's justice is closed and your amount due is zero because it is all paid by Christ. The resurrection is him writing across your heart and across history, paid in full. That's the glory of the resurrection. That's the, because it, it, it's proof that our sins have been conquered. See, do you know how to do, you know how to use the resurrection? You know how to use your receipts? You know how to get them out? See, what do you do when like shame starts to creep into your heart? When guilt starts to creep into your mind? When you start to have that little sneaking thought and suspicion that, man, God can't ever love me, can't ever do this with me. You start to have that fear that like this period of brokenness, this period of sadness, like this is, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the, the end of the story. Maybe this is how it all comes to play. No. When that happens, you get out your receipt. You get out the resurrection and say Jesus has conquered. And it says paid in full. See, the resurrection is not just the redescription of death. It is the overthrow of death. The resurrection just doesn't redescribe death. It is the overthrow of death saying paid in full. Your sins, all, all brokenness, all pain has been conquered by the living Messiah. And so resurrection, it disarms our doubts. It conquers our sins. And then the last thing is it revives our hopes. Look at verse 19 and 20. 
Paul says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we're of all people to be most pitied. You should feel sorry for Christians if they only have hope here. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. See, if Christ hasn't been raised, there's no hope. But if he has been raised, he's saying there is hope. Don't, don't you see, like, it wasn't the death of Christ that transformed the disciples. Who were they, what were they doing after the death? They were running around, scattered, betraying and denying and, and, and like hiding behind locked doors, all scared. It was after the resurrection where they were transformed. It was after the resurrection where they, they had confidence, where they became a force to be reckoned with, where they began to spread the message around. See, that's why Paul uses this word again and again. You heard him use vain, the word vain, the word futile, like verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. Verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. What he's saying is, listen, if there is no resurrection, then life is empty. Life is meaningless. Life is pointless because this is all there is. This is as good as it gets. This is the end of the story. There's really no hope. Nothing will ever be redeemed. Nothing ever will be fixed. But if Christ is resurrected, then there is hope. There is hope. And we use that word hope like we kind of water it down now, right? Like it's, it's just kind of, we just say it's like wishful thinking. And I think I have an illustration that we can all kind of resonate with. This is this opening weekend of Major League Baseball, right? And who do we play on opening weekend? We play the Cubs. Well, it's April. April, May, that's the time where if you're a Cubs fan, you still use that word hope a little bit. <laughs> you say things like, I hope this is the year. I hope we make it to the series this year. See, biblical hope's not like hope, Cubs hope. It's grounded in reality. <laughs> the biblical hope is actually grounded uh, in reality of what has happened, uh, namely the resurrection. Here's what it means, that if the resurrection is true, then there is no thing, no person, no body that is beyond the hope of God in Christ. See what, see what Paul said in verse 9? He said, I persecuted the church, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Like there's Paul, like you think your situation is hopeless and destitute and beyond fixing and salvation, your family, your dysfunction, your sin, whatever, like Paul persecuted the church. He was killing Christians. He stood against everything Jesus stood for. But because of the resurrection, there was hope for him in Christ. There was hope. It was real. It was true because Jesus is alive. And that's why it, does, it, it, it means something for us. Verse 20, see what, what he says. He says, Jesus was, in the resurrection, he was the what? The first fruits. What is that? That's a farming analogy, like a farmer plants a crop. Right at the beginning of the, of the season, like the, the first fruit starts to pop up, right? In the old days, they would take that fruit and they would taste it and they would offer it to the Lord as a sacrifice. But it was, it was proof. It was a picture. It was a foretaste. It was like a preview, a movie trailer of what was going to come. And he's saying, listen, if the first fruits, if Jesus is the first fruit, then there's still a great harvest yet to come. And you and I are part, if we're tied to Christ by faith, we're part of that harvest that is to come. And so there is hope for your situation. There's hope for this world. There's hope for you. If the resurrection is true, there is hope. You say, well, how can there, for lost people like us, how can there be hope? Look finally here at verse 21 and 22. Paul says, for as a man, Adam, came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now what, is, what in the world uh, does that mean? What in the world that, does, does that mean? Well, I got this illustration from another pastor, and, and this is a guy named Reuben Torrey, who was a preacher in the 1800s, great preacher, and he was preaching on those, th those two verses, and uh, like five days before he said to preach on, he said, like, I saw this verse lived out. He was part of a mountain climbing team, and he was up on the mountain, and he was watching another team on the other side, and there were five guys, and they were all tethered together, all strapped together, right? So it was like one, two, three, four, five down the mountain, and he's watching them, and all of a sudden, he sees the guy at the bottom slip, lose his footing, and fall off the mountain into the abyss. They're all tethered together, right? And so you know what's going to happen. The fourth guy fills the pull. The fourth guy lost. He was pulled off. The third guy was pulled off. The second guy was pulled off. As this was happening, the guy at the top, he saw what was happening. And he was, Tori said, the, the biggest, strongest, most powerful of all of them. 
and he saw, he's, he's anticipating what's going to happen. He said he took his pickaxe and one mighty swing into the mountain, and then he clung for all of his life. And of course, you know what was going to happen, right? There was coming a violent snap, a violent, horrible pull. And it snapped, and the weight, the lostness, the fallenness of all of those men bore down on the one man. But he held fast. And, and, and Tori said that, that the ropes that they were tethered began to, to pull and cut into him. And they began to choke him and cut off his circulation and even cracked his ribs from the pressure. But he held fast. And eventually he began to slowly climb his way out. And then the second man got his footing and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And then all of them got up the mountain safely. And he said, you see what that means, right, is that Adam, our forefather, the first man, he fell off the mountain. And when he fell, he pulled all of us with him. When he was lost, he, he made all of us fall off lost with him. But there was one man. There was one man who came, the strongest of, of us all, Jesus, who was willing to take the violent, horrible snap. He was willing to bear it on the cross. He was able to hold fast with the weight of all of our lostness, all of our fallenness, the weight of all of our sin hanging off. He held fast. And the Bible says on the third day, he climbed out. And if you are tethered to him, that means you have climbed out as well and that you will climb out. So you go, how? How do I know? How can I know that I can handle what comes in life? How do I know I'm not going to lose my footing? How do I know I can be secure? How do I know I can be rescued and be saved? Well, have you tethered, have you tethered yourself to the strong man? And if you have, you tethered yourself to Christ, he has been raised and you will be raised. If you've tethered yourself to him, he has been rescued and you will be rescued. If you tether yourself to him by faith, he has been redeemed and restored and therefore you and all of creation will be redeemed and restored. See, the resurrection disarms our doubts, it conquers our sins, and it revives our hopes. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth and hope of the resurrection. Jesus, thank you that you came as a strong man. You bore our weight, our fallenness, our lostness as we had fallen off the mountain. And Jesus, you climbed back out. God raised you from the dead, and now you are alive, you are living, you are reigning, you are ruling. And so, Lord, I pray with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 that we would know you and know the power of your resurrection. That we would know the truth of your resurrection. That you would enliven us. That we would be tethered to you and knowing in that that we would have assurance and confidence that our sins have been conquered, our doubts have been disarmed, and our hopes have been revived and made new. All because of the work your son Jesus has done. In his name we pray. Amen.